Um, I just want, Paul, thank you. We love the music. Um, I just want to uh, take a moment uh, before we dive into our second meeting and second uh, session on this um, just eye-opening book. Um, there's a lot of different terminology and description, I think, that we can all say. And I know I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, listening to it on audio and going back and rereading re it. Um, on behalf of the Kentucky Realtors and on behalf of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, we just want to, again, say welcome. We are glad that you are here uh, and excited about what this year is going to bring. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, before I pass it over to Raquel, I would like to thank uh, our KYR staff. If you all will just give them a quick Zoom clap. We want to thank Suzanne, uh, also Paul and Steve for being extremely supportive and always uh, accommodating and helping uh, Lester and uh, Lamont and I. Uh, on helping launch this uh, book club. A couple quick announcements. I urge you all to take the challenge that our <clears throat> National Association of Realtors president has encouraged all of our members to go on and do Fairhaven, which is a simulator. Also, he has encouraged us to complete our diversity and home um, designation. And then also there is a, a video that he is encouraging us uh, to take on uh, diversity and inclusion and just would like, if you all want any more information about that, please let us know. Also, mark your calendars for April 16th. Uh, the Kentucky Association of Realtors is doing an event uh, with our uh, NARAB and we've got our a very own president, Curtis Owens, um, who is uh, on our committee and he and Will Fisher have been working diligently on putting together some fantastic speakers for Fair Housing Month, which is coming up in April. So um, a lot of great things going on with our committee, but I'm not going to take any more time. And Raquel, I know we've got a jam packed hour. We've got some great scenarios for you guys. And we just ask that you have an open mind and an open heart. And just remember, we're all here uh, to help each other. So Raquel, I'll pass it over to you. Wow, thank you, Elizabeth. Always trying to match your energy is my biggest challenge <laughs> for the day. <laughs> I need a little more coffee, I'll get there. Lamont, you got some for me? <laughs> but anyway, it's great for you guys to be here and to show up, to be part of this conversation, to, um, educate ourselves like we're doing on, on what's come before us what's already happened and to find a plan to work together forward moving forward to uh, remedy some of what has already happened and of course prevent um pre pre prevent these discriminations and these disparities from continuing to happen we had a robust conversation last month and i thank each and every one of you that participated we can always acknowledge that we don't always agree. We don't always understand, but this group has always been respectful uh, of each other and each other's opinions. So I ask that you continue to do that even today. What we did last week, last month, it feels like last week, uh, what we did last month was we actually started with giving everyone an opportunity who's had time to read the whole book, some part of the book, or or listen to uh, even the synopsis of it to, to give us some takeaways, to give us some things that surprised them that they didn't know or understand about the book. And then we had some discussion following that. We will do that again today, but then we will start to um, get into the nitty gritty a little bit. We have some scenarios that we want to discuss that are real life, real time scenarios that are parallel to, to some of the things that happened previously. And uh, we just, discuss how we would react, how we should move forward and, and how we got here, okay? So I will open the floor to anybody that, that might want to share a, a takeaway or a, a surprising lesson of history that they learned by engaging in this book. Don't y'all be shy now. Yeah. Last week, last month, and I'll just get us going, last month when we talked about it, 
Many of the participants, including myself, were surprised by the history, surprised by the involvement of uh, the government, uh, surprised by the fact that a, a product that we use even today in an FHA uh, back loan was specifically um, engaged in, in, in keeping African Americans <coughs> out of home ownership, were purposely engaged in that. And one of the conversations we had in particular was why didn't we know this? Um, why weren't we taught this in our history and our, in our education? And a lot of people were surprised about that. Has, um, can anyone say that they were taught um, some of these lessons or, or some of this history in their schooling or their education? I know we weren't taught any of that, but it uh, it was a little it was surprising for me to see how the government really instituted discrimination in housing. I mean, it that just really kind of blew my mind. I thought it was more about uh, what uh, I mean. Can you all hear me? Okay, I forgot. I yeah, out, I left out my microphone. Okay, but. Um, you know, I, I thought it was more about how people reacted, you know, and that that, you know, the the public is who created that discrimination. But to see um, particularly early on in the book where he's talking about, you know, neighborhoods that were integrated from the beginning uh, with no incident and then forced to segregate that just uh, that just blew my mind. And then it's kind of like it's a continue to read example after example, you know, it, it really let me know that, you know, people are where they are, not by their own making, you know, you just wonder, had, had all this uh, segregation not happened, what, you know, what would our communities have been like? What would the wealth gap look like? What would everything look like if, um, you know, years past, African Americans had been able to own homes, and you know, if everything was normal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Any other comments regarding that? I was surprised yeah. how. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to back up what Ivy said to know how involved the government was, and to realize that a handful of people in a back room could convince the government or certain people in government to just push one person to make a move to decide what they decided for the entire country against minorities, I'm still impacted and overwhelmed by that. It's just amazing the government involvement in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I, I was surprised by the irony that um, uh, African-Americans were allowed to go and uh, fight in World War II, um, but when they came back home, they weren't afforded the same benefits as their uh, counterparts that uh, uh, were white. You know, they, they, they may have fought alongside them and shed blood, um, but then when they came home, they were still segregated um, and not allowed to have the same um, loan opportunities that uh, that whites have. Sort of I, standard. As a veteran, I would jump in and say I, I, I agree with that. That I, the FHA thing kind of shocked me, but the the VA that those loans were available and they transformed lives at the end of World War II. I mean, you, there are a whole communities that wouldn't exist today if it was not for those VA loans, and those were denied to a significant portion of the population. You know, and being from Louisville, you know, we, every year, unfortunately, we're breaking records. Um, and the one record we keep breaking is homicides. Um, and if you look at the map, a lot of them are uh, clustered in areas that, um, you know, are in the West End, Southwest End, uh, predominantly African American. And people uh, like myself who live out further uh, East, you know, the, the question always is, why Why is all that happened in the West End? You know, what's going on? What's the solution? What's the, uh, and it seems to all go back to 
the wealth gap, you know, that there was just no, uh, and just hopelessness. I mean, they just can't get out of that, um, still payday loans, so all these um, predatory loans practices still going on. They're not predatory, they're not illegal. They're like right on the line. And for some reason, they're still legal and they folks can't get out of this, uh, this cycle of debt. Um, and um, the only home ownership options seem to be uh, rentals, you know, not, uh, there's no real um, um, effort to uh, build affordable housing for folks to buy. Um, so they can't, you know, if I look at my um, historical or familial wealth, I mean, really any of it came from owning property um, and being able to transfer that wealth to the next generation. And that's, <laughs> that's my exit strategy. You know, I, I don't think that my poor kids aren't going to be sitting on a pile of cash. Um, but there will be equity in properties. Um, and that's created um, just a, quite a wealth gap uh, in those areas. Great, Lamont, there's a couple of things. Oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. You, you know, Lamont, you bring up a great point because as I was rereading like through the book from the audio, I started thinking about the, the racial zoning. And I started thinking about the West End because I've, I've done like a, over a hundred some odd transactions down there. And I started thinking about, you know, where a lot of those, you know, phase scary, on industrial and, you know, near until I read this book and I'm like, well, now that makes sense. You know, I mean, it just, it kind of put the, the puzzle together because I was going to go down there and help people, you know, you just help people and help people. Um, but I definitely, you know, I really, the, the chapter about racial zoning really kind of caught me this. Right. And I was actually going to tie that back to the book exactly that way, Lamont, you know, we had this section in particular, um, and you guys all touched on it about housing and housing options. So we're not just, we weren't just talking about home ownership. Remember we were talking about VA opportunities. We were talking about government sponsored housing that was both rental and home ownership. And in the book, it outlined how the opportunities for housing, both ownership and rental in minority communities was always subpar. So if the government built two communities you know, they built two separate ones, one for whites and one for minorities. And the ones that were built for minorities were of lesser quality. You know, they were more overcrowded and all of those things. So if, if that happens in that regard and we put those in those places and like Elizabeth said, then with the zoning, what they allowed was near these minority neighborhoods, they allowed pollution and industri industry and and I think in the book, they talked about the St. Louis area where they allowed, um, what was it, the trash, the waste, uh, the, you know, I'm talking about the, the junkyards, the places where waste to go. Yes. And right. they only allowed those by the certain communities. And then we look and we talk about what Lamont talked about, like what happened, you know, why, are, why is there so much, why do we have these ghettos, quote unquote, you know, why are people in these areas, why are the murder rate higher? Why is the wealth gap there? But now we look in the book and it was pretty intentional, wasn't it? Yeah. I think one of the things that uh, was clear to note that uh, racism uh, was already there, it, it, it existed. But, one of, but as you read through the book, we hear about different instances that happen and different things that happen from time to time, but it connects the dots. You know, we, we may see or hear something over here and think, well, why is it happening there in, the, in West Louisville like uh, Lamont uh, and like Elizabeth discussed? But this book helps us have a clear picture. It, it connects the dots. And then we uh, we keep hearing more and more today about systemic racism. And some people still say it doesn't exist. Well, I don't know if they say that because they don't believe it or they don't want to admit it. Uh, but the but again, the dots are clearly connected, and it what simply was and has been, and in some cases still is, uh, sy uh, systemic. And so, uh, then when you start 
moving through and looking at different things like income suppression because that came uh, just uh, along just like uh, the housing discrimination did. Uh, and then you start talking about the wealth gap and the education gap. All those things uh, are really connected. Uh, and when you start, uh, when you go back again, like uh, Lamont was talking about, here's how I'm leaving my wealth and I'm building it from, uh, from housing uh, and the building industry. And so uh, it's, Again, uh, that's the big point of the book. It allows us to have a big picture of how all these things uh, have worked and continue to work together. You mentioned the education gap, and that's another interesting, um, you know, really all my world is Louisville for the most part. So that's what I have to compare it to. You know, Louisville was, uh, I don't know if we were a, um, <laughs> a leader in a good way or, or, or not, but, you know, back in the 70s, you know, we had, uh, busing, you know, court ordered busing in Louisville. And, um, you know, it depends on who you talk to, you know, um, if that was, maybe it was a good thing for some people, but now it looks like currently Jefferson County Public Schools, they're like reversing that because it seemed like the issue was the reason they wanted, they needed to uh, segregate is because the schools in the West End didn't get any of the budgetary resources, you know, so they started to deteriorate. Uh, but now, so they, 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 they bust, I guess, whites into the West End and, and blacks into the East End schools, taking them out of their neighborhoods um, for both races. But now it looks like they're turning the exact opposite and they're trying to, and, and I don't know, it, correct me, because I'm, I'm learning here, but it seems like we're trying to uh, keep kids in their neighborhoods but make the schools better and the neighborhoods more attractive. And that kind of gets into not gentrification, but you know, where whites might actually move back into the neighborhood and blacks may want to move and feel more welcome in the East End so that there will be equality in both areas or all areas as it relates to housing and education and, and all that. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what seems to be going on here. Yeah, back into education again. Um, that was my first career, okay? So when um, prior to uh, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, our schools in Pike County were already integrated because we did not have um, that much of a population in any certain area. So children attended whatever school was in their neighborhood. So, you know, and, but, you know, given that, having that being said, the actual population there might have been 98% Caucasian and 2% Black or whatever. And so it was no real issue. Um, you know, they lived in the neighborhood, they went to school in their own neighborhood, and we would have been seeing that. In the city of Pikeville, they did have segregation. They had... Uh, the uh, Perry Klein School that they called uh, Northside. And at one time it was a high school too, from what, what I have discovered. But I had my best, very best friend, it's like my sister. She was, it was a, um, it was an integrated neighborhood. And, but yet they had the, the black school there. And so they played with either on a daily basis, but when it came to school, uh, they actually um, went to the white school, which was Pikeville uh, High School, Pikeville Elementary, and then their uh, friends attended um, the black school, the Prairie Klein School or Northside School, and uh, it got to the point where it was just an elementary school, and so they were integrated at the ninth grade with the, the Pikeville High School. But they allowed that school to exist until 1963. They were in the process, which kind of shocked me. They were in the process of building the uh, Pikeville Elementary School. And uh, so they got permission. And this kind of shocked me that they were given permission to wait on integration until 1963 when the elementary school was built. Because prior to that, they were all in one building. 
at the, the first grade or kindergarten, whatever, through 12th grade. And it shocked me that they allowed that to exist that long when this decision um, had been made in 1954, but they did get that approval. And that, that's kind of shocking to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christina, Christina Beasley, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, so I'm actually from the Bay Area. So what was interesting to me um, was to see how the intentional racial zoning still affects um, those areas today. And you think of San Francisco as being like one of the most liberal cities in the world. And, you know, we're not I, I went to high school and college in California and you're not taught anything about uh, any of those things about how, if you're unfamiliar with the area, Richmond, Oakland and San Francisco are like right on top of each other. You can view them from across the Bay. And it's not even just African-Americans, uh, Latinos are, you know, congregated in one area that's more San Jose. And then you have a lot of Asian in the city of San Francisco and then Richmond and Oakland are predominantly black and it's still like this in 2020. Um, so it was just really interesting to me just because most people, when I tell them I'm from San Francisco, they're like, Oh, you know, that's liberal, liberal land. And it, this book made me realize how much in denial we all are, you know, being from there. Um, and how those racial lines are still very, very prevalent in what you would think is, you know, this really forward thinking city. Um, it's pretty much just like any other major city in the United States when you really boil it down and they've done <laughs> nothing like most other places to correct those injustices done in the forties and thirties. And so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think the author had said that. I mean, if it could happen in San Francisco, <laughs> I mean, if it happens in San Francisco, then how could we believe that the rest of the, the, the country has not been affected in a negative fashion? Curtis, I see you unmuted. Did you want to chime in? No, I was just unmuted, but I will chime in since you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My story... My situation, uh, my experience is a little different from most of you all on the call. Um, one reason is because I'm an older black man. Uh, I, I, grew up, um, I grew up in the inner city. I, uh, I went to all black schools all my life until High, until I graduated high school, when I attended college was the first time that I went to integrated school. All my schools were completely black schools all the way through school because I was, I was before busing. And so, so a lot of things that people are reading about and talking about now, I've been knowing about all along. And I'm, it blows me away that nobody knew. <laughs> and so, so I just sit here and listen because you know, all these experience and reading this book, is, there was some, I got a lot of enlightenment out of the book, but a lot of this stuff I already knew, but because I was actually part of the protests in the 60s, I was at the protests when we were protesting open housing, which was the protest to, uh, to have fair housing here in Louisville. I was actually at the protests protesting. So it doesn't surprise me at all because I, and I, and I had a, I had a rich history, of le I had a, a history lesson a black history lesson I was taught by a black, a white teacher, a white teacher in middle school taught us black history, which that was totally illegal. He would have lost his job had he been found out. But so that's why I, I was privileged with the information early on. And I knew a black about, uh, you know, the history of things. And I experienced a lot of the history. Some of the things we read in the book, I experienced, I saw it for myself. I don't have, didn't have to read about it. And so, so none of it surprises me. And I get a, I got a little different angle on some of it. It says it's government sponsored, yes, but what is the government? The government is based on people. People. Yeah. And so, so, uh, so you know, I re I remember protesting at at the uh, what they call the Ninth Street Divide. There was hundreds, if not thousands, of people 
and there was an on Ninth Street. And on the west side of Ninth Street, it was all black people. On the on the east side of, of, of Ninth Street was all white people. And I mean it was people as far as you could see. And the black people were singing songs saying we should be able to live anywhere we want to live. The white people were saying, go home, we don't want you here. And I mean, I experienced that. <laughs> I was there. And we had a song we were singing. Uh, the mayor at the time was Mayor Schmeed. And we'd sing a song, Mayor Schmeed, you never can jail us all. Mayor Schmeed, segregation's bound to fall. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. We sung the song. There, uh, the white people on the other side would tell us to go home. Now, my grandfather, my grandfather was standing there and he said, Oh, there's Joe that works for me on the line of GE. And Joe was the white guy on the other side of the street. He said, hey, Joe, how you doing, Joe? And my grandmother said, don't you see Joe telling you you need to go home? <laughs> and, and we all laughed. And uh, but but, you know, that's just the way it was. What way it was. And of course, in 1968, the law was passed for a housing law was passed. So it was illegal. But up until that point, it wasn't. And when I first got in real estate, I saw many deeds that had deed restrictions on there and say that, that it's illegal for colored people to, to own houses in Shively or different areas. I saw many deed restrictions. I don't see them anymore, but I used to see them all the time uh, when I was selling houses initially when I first got in the business. So, you know, a lot of this doesn't surprise me, but I'm glad, I'm just glad to see that others are seeing it so that I, so they don't think I came from Mars when I if I talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> they know they really did exist. I didn't make it up. Yeah. That's oh, a great I think that's yeah. a great transition, Curtis. Thank you so much. Um, because you, you mentioned what you've been went through and actually living it and experiencing it. And then we also know that in, in the 1960s, uh, it was outlawed, it was illegal to to do that, um, to discriminate in, in these ways. So openly and on paper. <laughs> um, but moving forward from the 60s, we see that uh, there hasn't been so much change in where the racial lines are, are, are drawn or the, the gap, the home ownership gap we're still fighting with. Lamont mentioned education and, and Brenda talked about education. And I think we as real estate practitioners, if you still have any connection or contact with buyers, you may understand that student loans is a big issue. And what we know is that part of the wealth gap is that as minorities and African Americans uh, have been allowed legally into the system, they didn't have the benefit of the generations of equity that Lamont pointed out. So when we went to school, we had to take out student loans. So now to have the education, you know, you're in the, the you're still behind in dealing with that. So what can we do moving forward? I mean, the law happened, but the gap hasn't, you know, there hasn't been anything that happened to overcome, you know, the, the years of uh, intentional discrimination that had set, you know, set the entire race behind. So what can be done now going forward to, to, to I guess, um, lessen that gap or lessen that effect that negative effect that it has had on the community as a whole. Raquel, I think that's why things like uh, voting uh, are so important because it's our political leaders that have to actually make the laws uh, that allow and require things to be different. And so we don't often think deeply enough about what our political leaders are saying, or more importantly, not just what they're saying, what they're doing. And, and the song that was playing when we came on was an old Stevie Wonder song that talked about uh, you know, what you're saying, but you really haven't done anything. And so um, I, I guess the most important thing that we can do is continue to speak up. And as we saw the protests this summer, that's what people were saying. They were like, say something, speak up. Don't, don't let it, don't let these things happen in front of us and then not do anything. Uh, my background was not quite as deep as Curtis's. Uh, and uh, that, that, may make, that may date Curtis a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm just actually kidding there, Curtis. But, uh, but I did um, also attend 
all black schools in Shelby County uh, for the for for three years of elementary school. And then we uh, moved to Oldham County. I got to Oldham County. I was the only uh, black kid uh, in probably my classes, maybe until about the seventh or eighth grade. There are other black kids in the school, but not there. So those are uh, things as well that you live and, and you experience. And then I was at Oldham County when people started in high school, when people started, we start talking about the white flight. Uh, people start coming in droves and flocks to Odin County from Jefferson County because uh, because of that. So I kind of put two or three uh, things in there, uh, Raquel. Uh, but I remember taking a tour, <clears throat> excuse me, of of Louisville as a realtor, taking a tour, and we're on a bus, and <laughs> we now get off on the 9th Street exit downtown. And I knew what was to the right, you know, it's the 9th Street divide. And so, but the bus didn't turn. The bus, bus kept going across and cut over to go towards Churchill Downs. And it was the second time that it happened. So the, uh, the second time I said, hey, stop for a second. What's over there? I already knew what was there. Uh, never was lived in West Louisville a day in my life. Most people think I do or have, uh, and that's just an assumption. Uh, but, but we couldn't even tour to see what was there. So in our minds, we're like, no, let's don't show the people. Let's not show, and show realtors that part of town. There's something more important to show. Let's go straight across toward <laughs> Churchill Downs and then take the circle and then head back east. Uh, I just thought that was interesting from a standpoint of being a realtor uh, less than 10 years ago. Lester, you, you and Curtis both mentioned the 9th Street Divide. I know what that is because I'm from here. Can you explain what that is in Louisville? The 9th, nice, well, as you come off 9th Street, if you were to go straight across uh, to from north to south in the city, um, actually coming off on the main street area across over to uh, basically a, a Algonquin and, uh, area. To the right, it goes west. You're, it's considered West Louisville. And to the, uh, to the left, as you're coming off uh, the expressway, uh, that's considered downtown. And then further east in downtown, it's actually considered uh, east, uh, the east end. So, but most people now, Lamont, really think the east is, end is uh, out toward the Hurstburn or uh, all that area. But, uh, but there's actually an, an east end of downtown. And so that's where uh, the majority of black, uh, of black people uh, live. Uh, you're being you're being well, correct. I think. I mean, in my world growing up, that's a line yeah. you don't cross. That's what it means, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's 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 dangerous to go west of the Ninth Street. Uh, but 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 Lamont, you're correct for some people. And right. so I, I was shocked when I started first started working, and people didn't know where West Louisville was, they, or did not even know how to get to downtown because they'd never touched or seen that part uh, of, the, uh, of the community. So West Louisville really didn't exist uh, to a lot of people, they'd never been there. And so if you don't have people going there, they're not spending money, so they're not investing in that community. So there's no, so there's no return for even the people that have businesses uh, there, so. Uh, but but you're right. It, it, that's what it said to a lot of people. Don't go that way. That's correct. Um, Veronica, you had your hand up. Did you want to contribute? Yeah, um, I was just starting. It was just to your uh, point about what can we do to add in investment to these uh, areas that have been redlined and underserviced for decades on end. Um, so the opportunity zones, uh, 
is a program I don't, I'm sure many of you know about um, are mapped in historically underinvested neighborhoods. Um, I haven't mapped them per se up against the red line maps, but I'd wager there's some overlap there. Um, but the opportunity zones were designed to bring in investment, not just big commercial um, opportunities, but mom and pop entrepreneurship businesses as well, um, more businesses um, owned by people of color and bringing out diversity in that thriving, um, colorful, vibrant downtown space uh, with smart growth. Um, as well, there's just plenty, plenty, plenty of opportunities that can be found um, on the Smart Growth America website, Opportunity Zones. Look it up if, um, if you haven't heard about it. There's lots of great resources there, plenty of success stories on things we can do. Um, and KYR has the great economic and development program um, mm -hmm. that we're we doing again this year. So good projects to come. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Um feedback on what's been spoken. I, I think it's funny you guys talk about the the Ninth Street divide and a um, little known fact I am actually originally from Louisville. Right? So I was born in Louisville but I, I grew up here in Lexington but I was born in the West End of Louisville and I'll tell you back to what Elizabeth said this is completely just personal and not connected to real estate but as a young child born on the West End of Louisville I was severely asthmatic the pollution in that area literally affected my breathing. When we moved to Lexington at five years old, I was five years old when I moved from Lexington. By the time I was seven, I didn't even need an inhaler. Wow. So just think about that. What if my mother had stayed in Louisville, you know, on the West End in that poll polluted area? And, and, you know, she was, we were in the projects, a housing, public housing um, project at the time you know, would my trajectory be different? And of course it would, you know, your health affects your education, affects your well-being, affects, you know, everything that, that moves forward. But um, before I said that, what I was going to mention about the Ninth Street Divide, it sounds to me like in every book, in every movie, in, in every city, you know, there's those railroad tracks, right? Right. <laughs> People being, I, you guys all lived somewhere that had the other side of the railroad tracks, Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and we just, we, we didn't, like Curtis said, we knew it, but we didn't, me, part of we, didn't know the, the intentionality of it. You know, you thought it just kind of happened. You thought people just sort of, you know, migrated based on tradition and history and because they look like each other. But, um, but you got, that's a familiar concept for everyone, right? Yeah. Well, uh, Raquel, not only is it a familiar concept, but I think in the African American community, it was known that people lived, and this is a statement, on the other side of the track. That was a statement. They live on the other side of the track, mm -hmm. giving direction as to where uh, many African Americans lived. And so, uh, I mean, we it's a phrase that we didn't think about and we didn't connect here, but it's but it's been in our lives forever. Well, when I grew up on the in the California neighborhood of the West End, I did not know why they called it the California neighborhood in some recent years. It was called California because that's as far west as a black person could go. You couldn't go past 18th Street. I remember we never went across the other side of 18th Street. I, I knew that. You know, I knew white people in other side of 18th Street, but I didn't realize. I just know if you go past 18th Street, you better be running back the other way. And that was just it from 18th Street to the Parkway. You just didn't venture that far. And that's why they called it California, because it's as far west as you could go. Yeah, I have an interesting topic along those lines. You know, we, we often talk right now about gentrification and um, Veronica pointed out some programs like the Opportunity Zone, and, and a lot of times I, I hear those things turning into a negative conversation about gentrification. But what about the fact that, like Curtis, all of his life he was not allowed or Black people did not go past this certain street or this certain neighborhood, and then the laws changed, and then they become educated, and then what they want to do is nothing more than to be able to go wherever they want, right? 
So they want to go. Now all of a sudden you're allowed to go to the other side. So we immediately as a community, as we got successful and, and educated, we moved to places where we weren't allowed to, maybe out of spite or maybe because, you know, we actually were able to do that. And now we're looking at our neighborhoods being gentrified. And when I work in these neighborhoods and, and I'm looking and, and we'd like to keep them um, diverse, we see as they, uh, we see that, you know, you go in and you remodel houses and, and you create nice neighborhoods and communities within areas that were, per, you know, previously not those areas. It is hard to get minorities to come back because as Curtis said, you know, we spend our whole life trying to get out and then so it's a it's a it's a dilemma that we have within these neighborhoods have you guys experienced that or had any um, opinion about that even even more than that is the problem that if you go in and you rehab these neighborhoods many of those people who have gotten older in those neighborhoods can't afford to come back because now the price has risen and it's beyond their means to afford and i, I think a bigger question than that is what, where do those people go? Because there isn't any place today where we can put them and they still be homeowners. Right, right. Elizabeth? You know, I, I just really kind of wanted to see what else um, you all were thinking because I think Lester brought up a great point is, you know, getting out and voting. Like, you know, my, my thing is, is what can we do to continue to educate we can get out we can vote what other things can we do to bridge the, this gap well i'm gonna bring it up i'm gonna hit the, i'm gonna bring up the bombshell uh there's a lot of cities chicago one included north carolina just did it they've imposed a type of reparation. And what they've done in North Carolina is they gave $25,000 to black residents to help them to purchase a home or education. And they've done the similar thing in Chicago. They, 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 they funded it in North Carolina through the uh, marijuana uh, proceeds. And so uh, that's what's happening in some places today. If you look at the news, you'll see that that's happening in, in some places today. They're doing that type of reparation to try to bridge the gap that has occurred. Now, a lot of people I know a lot against the reparations. And that's why I say I'm opening up a bombshell. But that's, we're talking about bridging the gap to make it happen. I mean, we, that's what we're talking about, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Well, Curtis, I've never heard of the reparation thing, but about. I like that idea. I think that's what we're talking about. But I think I think you got to be careful with that word because it carries a lot of baggage. But I think what you're on is is exactly the right thing because we have denied people the opportunity to build wealth over generations. The only way we're going to correct that is we have to somehow incentivize them to become homeowners. And it's tough right now because there's such a shortage of low uh, affordable housing. I mean, it's it's incredible. And I was looking at uh, new listings today. And a new home, 1,200 square feet, selling for 189.9. That's just incredible. In in a community where I live, um, I don't even know if $25,000 would help would be enough to help somebody get into a home. But that's what we've got to do is we've got to figure out some way to create a program that supports people moving out of some of these neighborhoods that need to be rehabbed, basically into uh, decent housing where they can build equity in their homes. <clears throat> Mike, I'm gonna get a couple of people that have their hands raised. Um, Bahar, can't, oh, there you are. Yes, hi. <laughs> uh, thank you for having this discussion. I think it's really useful and very educational. Um, here in Lexington, where I'm a, a newer realtor, we had um, a discussion on this book by the Lexington Community Land Trust and um, Mr. Peoples, who's one of the uh, local uh, leaders here in the African American community had a suggestion which I thought was was good um, for individuals who've lived in areas that are becoming gentrified here 
uh, who have owned their homes, uh, who, who have their homes paid off are unable to afford the property taxes, some of them. So they're forced to sell and leave that there should be some sort of relief for people who have lived in a neighborhood for a long time who had some gentrification in that neighborhood that have made the property values go up that make their property taxes go up get some sort of relief or help um, and i don't know if there are any grants that they can apply for to, for help with property taxes or if that's um, something that we can help pursue to help people in those situations yeah yeah city governments would have the ability to exempt the same way they do with that homestead exemption. So I, I was on that call and that was a great point. I'm yeah. gonna get a couple other hands here just to make sure everybody gets to speak. Um, Will, Will Fisher. I, I just wanted to take a moment and kind of piggyback off what Curtis was saying too, that uh, the Evanston City Council passing their reparations package just recently was one of the topics the Fair Housing Policy Committee was talking about. And their first phase of it, which was approved eight to one, uh, was a $400,000 grant that was going to be distributed out in $25,000 pieces to individuals to help in housing. The one person that did vote against it on the council was an individual that was for it, but at the same time, she didn't like the idea that it had to necessarily go to housing because one, it kind of perpetuated the idea that the individuals who would be receiving this money, which had to be people that proved that they lived in the area between 1919, I think 1968, or had relatives who did, uh, couldn't control their finances or be able to manage those funds appropriately to be able to use for whatever they went. Because a lot of those people who live in those areas might not necessarily imagine buying at that time or, or need to use that towards housing. So the ability to use those funds the way that they seem fit, she wanted them to take it a step further. Now, you know, as far as Kentucky is concerned, yeah, we could do the exact same thing. And that's their hope is they're going to be able to use this as a stepping stone, not only from their local level, but other local levels and from a national level to be able to use some of these additional funds, whether it be from cannabis sales or something else to move it forward. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was a step in the right direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kay, I see your hand is up. I, I have a problem with the word reparations because it implies that these funds should be only opened up to um, um, to one one group of people when you have Mexicans and you have uh, other people of other races who have housing problems and housing issues too. I think if you're going to offer um assistance in the way of grants that it should be open to all people of color of people of different nationalities of people of other immigrant status to identify it as reparations implies that it's only available to one group of people who are um, quite deserving of it but i think it should be termed maybe as a grant versus reparations we can't fix the past. I can't do anything to fix what occurred with regard to slavery or any other mistreatment of individuals. All I can do is go forward. But I think it, the word reparations is an offensive word to me because it's entitlement to one group of people when there are many, many people who suffer who may not even have color of skin. They may be um, an immigrant from um, another country and they're, um, there are many prejudices against people who don't appear in society to have a problem. You may not think I look like I have a problem, but I'm not Caucasian. I'm semantic. And it, it's, it's not just color that people have a prejudice against. So, I mean, I find the word reparations offensive, but I want to open it up to all people, all immigrants in our country deserve the right to have a home and a safe place to live. And um, grants, I think, would be probably the most appropriate term. That way it doesn't designate one class of people. It opens it to all people. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Elizabeth, did you have a response? Or were you responding to that comment? I see your hand up. 
No. Uh, let, let, let me say okay. something, Ben. Uh, I know that reparations, yeah, we're here today for one reason, <clears throat> because we know that these conversations are tough. And so yeah. when people hear the word reparations, some people may be offended uh, by it. Uh, and I, I heard what Kay said. Kay said, well, I can't go back and fix that. And, and the truth is, people are, uh, when they talk reparations, it's not talking about going back and fixing it. Because what's done is want, is what's done. But I, I, I was given something not long ago, and I passed this on to someone. And I think even it might have been Dr. Cosby that said that, and I'm talking about Kevin Cosby, so no. Uh, now, he doesn't hesitate. He's he's a minister of one of the fastest growing churches in the city, and he talks reparations uh, all the time. But an example that he gave is, okay, and this is strong. <clears throat> okay, if you steal my car and then you give it back to me, you did the right thing. Yeah, you sinned by stealing my car and you gave it back to me. But if you don't put new tires back on it, if you don't put gas in it and repair the damage that you was that was was done, then you didn't make me whole by taking all that away. And what he's talking about is four hundred years dealing with slavery, where that was free labor that was basically stolen labor as it's, de as it's de described as. And so that's why reparations really is a tough conversation because that's what you're dealing with. Um, that, uh, that thought and that process uh, in particular. Okay, I have another hand up. I, I, I have, I'm sorry, hang I on just a second, Kay. Uh, okay. Let me be Ivy then, we're back to Kay. Okay. All right, I just wanted to comment, um, you know, to Kay a little bit um, on why you would do something like this for a particular group. And uh, when you have a particular group of people who, through the history of this country, have been um, held back, have been denied, have been enslaved for so many years. And the thing about this book, uh, it, it really lets us know that although we were freed, you know, from in, being enslaved, a lot of the actions that, take, that have taken place over the years have gone a long way towards still keeping these, this, this same group of people down. And, you know, before, really before looking at this book, I don't know that I was thinking so much about reparations as I am now because a lot of the a lot of the systemic things practices that were put in place really could have changed the trajectory for a lot of African Americans and and even now even giving the 25,000 or you know whether you call it grant whether you call it reparations it still adds up to reparations for uh, the group of, for African-Americans in particular. Yes, there are other people, there are white people that need help. There are, you know, people from other countries that need help, but at the same time, they don't have the same history of being denied time and time and time again. So, by the law. <laughs> by, yeah, by the law. I mean, it, it, and it, it, and it, it really, it's really kind of sad because now I'm starting to understand why when sometimes I'll go and talk to people about home ownership that it has never occurred to them. They have never thought that they could be a homeowner. Never really even, you know, felt like it was part of a, a dream that they could have. And so now, you know, I find myself trying to convince them that yes, it is. Well, no, they're not going to let me. What do you mean they are not going to let you? If, if you're qualified, let's see what what where you are. Let's let me try to help you get there. But because of the way everything has been set up, people don't even have that dream in some areas because they've been 
you know, denied for so long. But, you know, I don't want to keep talking. <laughs> but, but Let's yeah. let Kay and then I see Tanya and Brenda have their hands up. And I, I know we're short on time. I want to give everybody an opportunity to talk. I'm, a, I'm all about healing. And I think healing is a powerful thing. Uh, you can't undo the past. And in order to go forward into the future, you have to have what's called a healing. Does everybody agree with me on that? Uh, and I'm, the reason why I relate to that so much is I can't undo the Holocaust. I can't go back and get six million people alive again, you know, but there were no reparations for us. And um, although uh, there are people still seeking reparations, I don't find that a healing thing. I find that word a troubling word. And the reason why I'm, I feel your pain about your slavery for all those years and the misconduct of people and with governments and all of it, I truly feel that. But I think for um, going forward in life, you have to have a forgiveness and a healing. Even if you've been mistreated by people, you can't go forward until you forgive. I think everybody would agree with me on that because um, hatred is an all-consuming thing. It's a destructive thing. But the positive is to go forward with a healing attitude. So if you become exclusive to one individual class of people, it makes more resentment and less healing. So I think the term is what's so troubling to me because I want to see healing in our nation. I want to see healing in our relationships it's very important but i just learned through the holocaust that uh forgiveness is everything i mean that's my two cents um tanya okay um well reparation for me i don't find that word offensive but they want to you know somebody wants to call it something else that's fine however the reason i don't find it offensive is because um and I think some people may, is because we didn't have this history. We didn't have, any, so all the segregation we just assumed was um, de facto law, you know, um, happened by accident or happened by choice and come to find out it's, it's just not. So we have generations and generations of primarily African-American people who have had uh, extra property taxes imposed on them and at different situations like that where like my family my, my parents and my grandparents got equity in their home where you know people that was across the track will say couldn't get that they couldn't have the expendable income because it was all they could do to pay the property taxes and so you know generations down the road whenever um you know my family inherits a home they're they're getting equity where someone else can't even pay for um, updates and, you know, keeping it up. And, but the reason I feel like, you know, we call it whatever, but I really, I feel like it is, you know, something it, it, it's, I like the definition because it is repairing something that our government did. So we were saying we're giving everybody this freedom at that time, but there was all these things in place, keeping it from happening that the government put in place that kept it from happen, happening. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. I'll read real quick, and then I, I've got a couple of people here we're going to get to. But the definition of reparation is the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wronged. So the definition itself is, is healing, is um, offering a way forward and a, a forgiveness to you know, forgive those that have been wronged and allowing a way to move forward. Brenda, did you have a comment related to that? Yes, yes. I wanted to say that, you know, I think that's exactly what we need to do because of the fact just my daddy always said, walk a mile in the other man's shoes or woman's shoes before you can judge anything. And, you know, to stop and think that they suffered you know, that people suffered, their ancestors did, through slavery. And $25,000 is not that much money. 
to address the gaps that exist in wealth, in housing, in education, uh, you know, but we can try to make amends and give a leg up and help uh, address this. And I think that's what we definitely should do. And, you know, if you can't do it on a national level, then maybe it has to be on a city by city or state by state. But we have to start somewhere. And we have to address it because it's not right. right. You know? and, and we've known that for years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, even uh, Scottish prisoners that came to, the, to America as prisoners and were sold as indentured slaves, after they paid back what the um, actual voyage had to get to America, then they were given, they could get land. They could do what they wanted to. So, I mean, I, I kind of equate a lot of this to, because they came as slaves too. Mm -hmm. But it was there was an amends made at some point, and I think we need to address that inside our nation today. And I don't know that we can really go forward until we do. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get Christina, then Lester. They were on hold, but I, I did also want to mention just with Kay because we we do appreciate and agree with what you're saying. But there have been. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there have been reparations paid to Holocaust victims yeah. in other parts of the world. It, I'm fairly yeah. confident in Germany they had um, Holocaust survivors and their families have re received reparations. As well as right. Native, Native Americans also. Native, okay, okay. Well, right. I, I actually, those reparations were for art, you know, art that was stolen. Those families that could prove they had art that was stolen, those reparations were made. But the typical poor uh, immigrant Jew was not compensated for anything when they lost their, you know, four and five generations of families. So reparations were only given to Jews that actually could prove that they had art objects stolen. So it's different than, um, and you know, I know people who are Japanese and Chinese and all of those people were put in internment camps and mistreated throughout the years. So, you know, I'm just looking at a healing for our nation. It has to be for everyone. It has to be, um, it has to come on a one-to-one -one basis and it has to come from our support and from uh, from us building relationships. But, you know, if you called it a grant, you would reduce, I think, hostility over that. Because I've, I've talked to a lot. This book is a very interesting book. It's more than interesting. It's it's shocking. But the thing about it is, if when you are exclusive to any class of people, you don't have that complete wholeness, that healing. And words are important. They can be destructive and hurtful and uh, prevent healing. So I'm, I'm just sorry. I'm just throwing my two sits in because it's a very tough subject to discuss. Let's and, uh, Christina, uh, then Lester. Uh, Christina Beasley, then Lester. They're in order. All right. Uh, and Kay, I, I, again, I, um, I appreciate uh, what you're saying and what we have to be careful of because it often happens is that races and cultures are played against one another when it comes to issues just mm -hmm. like this. And you can't get caught up in that. And this isn't just about reparations. We just have maybe talking about reparations with African-Americans because of the book, but, effort, uh, but uh, reparations uh, have already been set up as, uh, as Curtis mentioned earlier uh, with uh, with some Asian Americans, uh, it it's happening uh, now. I think they're even attempting to do more in some places in California. Not yesterday, but as we speak, those are things that are happening. And and it did happen. And I don't know. Uh, I know it happened. And uh, with some of the Holocaust uh, victims, and so we can't. We don't want to discount any uh, any uh, any people. Uh, from what they've been through and that's certainly not what this is about but but fixing things and doing it the right way that's that's what makes these conversations tough because people do believe what they believe some say no some say one thing didn't happen some say slavery didn't happen but 
But these are real life things that we know that have happened. And so let's not get caught up in pitting one against the other. One should and one shouldn't. If you deserve it, that's what you deserve. And the period goes behind that. Yeah, I agree. Lester, I had a great analogy given to me previously regarding cancer research and fundraising. So if someone comes to you and asks you to donate for a breast cancer cause, nobody stops and says, oh, well, what about lung cancer? Why are you just raising for breast cancer people? You know, there are other people with cancer. Well, no one is negating the other cancers or other diseases, but at the moment when you're focusing or supporting one particular area, I mean, that's completely okay. Uh, and Christina, I'm sorry, I keep saying I'm going to get to you and I don't. Go ahead, Christina. Beasley. <laughs> so I feel like we would be remiss if we didn't bring up some other issues with the African American experience or the Black experience in America. Because the rate, I know we're focusing just on housing right now, but we systematically change families with with the welfare system with with black families we systematically in our judicial system i mean coming on all fronts towards the black community in our country we've been doing this for generations so it's not just a matter of housing it's i mean it when you get into welfare back in the 60s when it was created men were not allowed to live in these homes it was for women and children so you eventually created these minority families with with no father figures in, in the home. And that's still prevalent today. You see it. Um, and that was government mandated. And then you see our, our judicial laws. Um, in a, my previous lifetime, I was a criminal justice major. And if you even look at the statistics of blacks in prisons versus whites and, and, and the population density, it's amazing to see the disparities just in those. And so adding in this book and reading how that was all formulated, they're all intertwined and they're all making this. So tying this back to Kay's comment, like we need to heal. Yeah, we do need to heal, but this isn't just, you know, preventing buying homes. This has been systematically done to blacks for generations on all fronts in our society. So whether you call it reparations or anything else is inconsequential. I mean, there's so many different avenues that need to be addressed and changed as a society in order to allow us to go forward. And I think, I know we're focusing just on home buying and making home buying more attainable for minority groups, but without addressing these other societal issues, that's going to be a problem. And it's, it's a big problem when you look at it as the whole picture like that. But I just, her comments got me thinking like, this is so way beyond just FHA and VA and, you know, having these projects that were racially segregated. I mean, this has been continued in every aspect of black American lives for decades. So um, yeah, thank you. thank you, Christina, for the app, uh, the input. And you are correct. I mean, it's it's much larger, um, but we're just realtors. <laughs> we're just <laughs> so we we were uh, you know focused on the space where we at least had a little bit a little bit of knowledge or a little bit of input. But it does all go together, and I believe it's that chicken and egg debate. Like like what what came first? You know what what caused it? But but. I think everyone would agree that your home, where you go home to every day, it is essential. It's essential. Um, I think, Brenda, do you still have your hand up? No, no. Okay, and Lester? Okay. Anybody else? I would just like to say that to uh, reply to uh, what Kay was saying, uh, Kay, I don't know if you know or not, but I, I, I believe. The black people are probably the most forgiving people I've ever seen in, in, in <laughs> that I can even imagine. And I don't know if it has to do with the religion, the church, and all that, but uh, black people are very forgiving people. As a matter of fact, uh, I think black people have Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. I, I like that. So I, that's, I don't think that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You guys, I'll just say, um, this is great conversation. 
I know we went over a little bit. We could, you guys, if, if we didn't have houses and businesses and stuff to get out there and deal with, you know, it, it'd be great. We could, we could do this all day. We will do this again next month with a, a, a different book and, and continue to encourage these conversations. I would like to, to wrap it up by, by a couple of things. You know, we had talked about um, reparations and we've talked about the things that the government has done in these regards. We just barely touched on some of the solutions, but I, I guess what I would say, if you guys give me the opportunity to close, I do think having such a diverse group here is part of the solution. Having these conversations with people that we normally would not talk to or, or be in the room with even, you know, that's having this conversation. Because I think when we see people like, you know, Ivy and Curtis and, and Will and Christina and Tanya, all of us are different and from different places and, and generations and look differently. I think that we are also demonstrating that fixing this issue that has been created purposely and intentionally by our government does not just benefit black people. It does not just benefit people of color. It benefits our entire community because we're all in this thing together. We all live together. You don't want to be scared, Lamont, to go to any part of the city, right? So it's not just black people that are affected or poor people or any people, it's the entire community that is affected if we don't address these issues together because we should be able to go anywhere and feel safe. We want all of our children to be educated. We want all of our families to have homes and safe places to live. So uh, it, it is, we're specifically talking about some race issues here, but I, just, I appreciate you guys showing up when it may not, or people think that it may not affect them directly, but I, I just appreciate and, and honor you guys' um, acknowledgement that it does, that it affects all of us, a community and an industry as a whole. So thank you guys. Well, you have to be the change you want to be. Absolutely. Yes. And, and guys, on behalf of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, we look forward to seeing you next month uh we will get i know paul uh we're already working on our next book so just you know we'll have you on the edge of your seat we'll get that book out to you and i look forward to continuing so uh this uh fantastic conversation so again raquel thank you uh and thank you to the staff and thank you lester for leading this uh committee yeah, thank you great job raquel thank you thank you everyone